Well, welcome, welcome. We are wrapping up a series tonight. Um, and uh, this series is taking a toll on me personally. Um, it's been said that the person who teaches actually ends up getting the best lesson out of the whole thing. Um, just because you end up going just into this deep, deep, deep study. And, and so um, this story, I actually walked into it thinking it would be easy. And this last part is just wrecking me. Um, and we ended last week um, at verse uh, 1 of chapter 41. And there's, there's 50 chapters. And so basically we've got nine chapters to cover tonight. And um, I'm so thankful for technology. I was uh, in the middle of um, finishing up my slides for the week. And um, I decided I would go ahead and upgrade to Mavericks. Those of you Apple users who... who um, you know, you've got a MacBook or something at home or an iMac. Um, a new operating system came out. And I never, ever, ever update my phone. And I never update my computer on Wednesdays. And they almost always come out on Wednesdays. Um, I think it came out yesterday. But um, I don't do it because, like, Wednesday's a busy day. And today I thought, ah, it'll be fine. Um, and, like, my computer kind of crashed. Um, so... Um, and I hadn't backed up everything and, and all that kind of stuff. So we've got no slides or anything like that. Thank you, Apple. So that's how we're going to start tonight off, covering nine chapters without slides, without anything on the screen. So I hope you have a Bible in front of you. This would be one of those occasions where we love to put the Bible on the screens. So if you didn't bring one, you forgot it, you don't have one, that, that you can kind of follow along. Um, but tonight, it's just not happening because there's like nine chapters worth of stuff and... Um, and it was just kind of a last minute um, call to Apple. And they said, sorry about you. So uh, we got nothing on the screen tonight. But hopefully you can follow along on your phone, on your app, or, or in your, what Josh Inman calls a scriptural printout. Um, your actual, like, thing that you hold in your Bible that has pages and maps and a table of contents and probably a lot of dust and stuff like that as well. Um, so we, we left off, like I said, in chapter 41. The very beginning of chapter 41, um, we, we ended off with after two whole years and basically leading up to that point that Joseph was in prison for two years being forgotten. At 17 years old, he got thrown into a pit because he showed his new robe off that his dad gave to him and didn't give to his brothers. They threw him in a pit. Understandable, right? You probably would have done it too. Um, and then they're like, well, let's not throw him in a pit. Let's not let, leave him there for dead. Let's make some money off him, right? These are good guys, just full of the Holy Spirit. Let's make some money off our brother, um, about two years' wages. And so they make some money off him. They sell him to a, a slave owner who sells him to another slave owner, which is basically Potiphar, the second in command at Egypt. And so he does great in his position of slavery, and he is given a promotion all the way to the top, second only to Potiphar. And so it's a big deal. And then almost as soon as he gets the promotion, because he's a handsome young man, Potiphar's wife starts looking at him. And uh, she's like, I want a little bit of piece of that. And she goes after him repeatedly, um, only to be rejected. And um, the scorn of a woman has created a fire. And um, she lied. And uh, they threw him in prison. So he's in prison. He meets this cupbearer and this baker. And they have dreams. And they wake up just really upset. And he says, what's wrong? And they say, we have these two dreams. They explain the dreams. He interprets them, remember? And one of them has a really good interpretation. And one of them thought he was going to get a good interpretation. And he said, no, you're actually going to die in three days. <laughs> awesome. I got three days in prison, like the rest, that stinks. It's almost like if you've got three days to live and you're free, you can at least go jump out of a plane or something. You know, but it's like you got three days to live and it's going to be spent in prison. What? Random screams from middle schoolers tonight. Unbelievable. Um, so, the interpretations come true. And do you remember what Joseph did before he, before he told them? Before they got out to go see Pharaoh, he said, remember me, right? Put in a good word with Pharaoh because I need out. 
And so the guy that gets the good interpretation forgets for how long? Two. two years. For two stinking years because he forgot. And whether he forgot or whether he like chose to forget or made, like didn't want to, you know, because if you just got out of prison and your head is not on the chopping block for the first time in a couple years, my guess is maybe you selfishly don't say anything because you're like, I'm not stirring anything up, right? No trouble. I'm going to do my job, and, and I'm going to keep out of prison. So Joseph is sitting there in prison. Time has passed, okay? Because where we're about to pick up the story, he is 30 years old. Do you remember how old he was when he was thrown into the pit? 17, 17 right? Not just a couple of years. I mean, we're talking about maybe 11 or so years in Potiphar's work, um, and then two years in prison. Um, and so he has been a slave um, or in prison for 13 years, almost the entirety of like his life up until he was 17. Like he spent 17 years living free and then he spent 13 years in, in work. And even if you consider like the fact that he's working for Pharaoh in just a couple minutes, um, his life, like he is very acquainted with living in jail or, or under someone's ownership. I love you too. That's, that's, wow. Okay. All right. We're going to get there sometime, guys. All right. I'll tell you what. Why don't we pray and we'll get started. You bow your heads with me. Father, we thank you for tonight. I thank you for these students. I thank you for just, um, I thank you for this story and what it means to us. Um, God, we just, we ask that you would be present here. We ask that you would give us the focus and the, and just the, um, the openness to what you have in your scripture, God, and, and I pray that, that as we kind of truck towards the end of Joseph's life in this story, that we would really see something that changes us, Lord, that you would mold us. And so, God, we just thank you for that. Um, Lord, it's in your name I pray. Amen. Um, so we're in Genesis 41. Here's what we're going to do. We're, we're going we're gonna to get from Genesis 41 all the way to Genesis 50, okay? We're not going to read all of it. For certain, but we are going to read the first portion of 41, and then we're going to kind of skip along, so, so pay attention if you can. So verse 41, I'm sorry, chapter 41, verse 1. After two whole years, Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing by the Nile, and behold, there came up out of the Nile seven cows, attractive and plump. They fed in the, in the reed grass, and behold, seven other cows, ugly and thin, came up out of the Nile after them. And stood by the other cows on the bank of the Nile. And the ugly thin cows ate up the seven attractive plump cows. And then Pharaoh awoke. Okay? He goes back to sleep. He has one more dream. He fell asleep. Um, and behold, seven ears of grain, plump and good, were growing on one stalk. And behold, after them sprouted seven ears, thin and blighted by the east wind. And the thin ears swallowed up the seven plump full ears. And Pharaoh awoke. Behold, it was a dream. Okay, so verse 8. Um, in the morning, his spirit was troubled. He sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all the wise men. Pharaoh told them his dreams, but no one could interpret them to Pharaoh. Let me pause real quick for a second, give you a little context. This is normal back then. We've talked about this. The, the, the rulers um, would often um, believe, whether they were, um, you know, believed in this God or, or that God, they would believe that, that, that a God would come to them in a dream and give them kind of a picture of the future. And in this case, it's happening. And the God is making this happen. The one true God. There is no false God making this happen. This is God's work. And so um, God um, somehow providentially, you know what I mean by providentially? It means like by his power and by his choosing and like he gives one man the interpretation. But, but guys like Pharaoh are used to hearing interpretations from other guys, magicians and, uh, and wise men. Um, and so they would look to the stars at times, and, and sometimes they would just look inward, um, you know, and, and so there's all kinds of different methods to this. But in this case, the only person that could interpret the dream was, um, was Joseph. I almost said Daniel. The parallels between Joseph's story and Daniel are kind of oddly similar. Um, if, you haven't, if you haven't grown up with that, uh, maybe we can cover that sometime soon. So um, the chief cupbearer, this is so interesting, verse 9, the chief cupbearer said to Pharaoh, I remember my offenses today. <laughs> Two years later, it's like, oh, hey, I meant to tell you. There's this guy in prison that should have been out a long time ago. I remember that today. Timely, right? 
Um, so he, he does put in a good word for him. Verse 10, when Pharaoh was angry with his servants and put me and the chief baker in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, we dreamed on the same night, he and I, each having a dream with its own interpretation. A young Hebrew, doesn't even name his name, uh, maybe he's forgotten it at this point, um, was there with us, a servant of the captain of the guard. When we told him, he interpreted our dreams, giving an interpretation to each man according to his dream. As he interpreted to us, so it came about, I was restored to my office and the baker was hanged. <laughs> like, just so matter of fact. What's interesting about this is that you're tempted to think like, oh, he finally remembers, good for Joseph, you know, and, and maybe this guy has had a change of heart and he wants to help Joseph. And here's what I'm thinking. This guy is still out for his own self. Like he's still covering his own neck because Pharaoh's upset at this point. He's looking for a solution. And the person that brings the solution is the person with the king's favor. And so he says, oh, I think it's time for me to go ahead and pull, pull the ace out of my, my sleeve and give it to you. There's this guy that I know that can do it. And so there's an interesting conversation that happens after that. Pharaoh sent and called Joseph. This is interesting to notice. They quickly brought him out of the pit. He shaved himself and changed his clothes. He got ready, okay? So he, he, you know, he, he got primped up for Pharaoh. Verse 15, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream and there is no one who can interpret it. I've heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Big verse coming up, okay? I want you to highlight it or, 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 or maybe, maybe even like highlight it on your phone or something like that. Verse 16, Joseph answered Pharaoh, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. Here's what happens. Joseph gets the chance to save his own neck, right? And he's still going to do what he's called on to do. But you see this all through the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament. You see it in the story of David versus Saul, where David is quick to give God the credit and Saul is quick to take it for himself. Um, even in the New Testament, you see things happen, and, and even like maybe in Acts. Um, there's stories where people um, keep money for themselves to, to kind of provide for themselves, which is a statement that God doesn't provide for me, I provide for me. And when you take your own credit, when you try to provide for yourself, what you're saying in that statement, this major statement, is that I've got this, right? I'm, I'm God, in a sense. What Joseph is saying is, listen, you just need to, this is my disclaimer. Um, this is up to God. And so he didn't even start out saying, yes, I can help you. Finally, I get the chance. He's been in prison for two years, right? Wouldn't you be tempted to be like, yes, yeah, so I can help you? Maybe not like that, because that'd be kind of awkward, but... God will give you a Pharaoh, uh, Pharaoh a favorable answer. So Pharaoh tells him the dream, right? Explains it exactly the same as he had it. Um, he's been thinking about it for a while. Verse 25, Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one. Okay, in other words, there's two dreams, but they have the same purpose. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he's about to do. The seven cows are seven years, and the seven good ears are seven years. The dreams are one. The seven lean and ugly cows that came up after him are seven years, and the seven empty ears bleated by the east wind are also seven years of famine. It is as I told Pharaoh, God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. There will come seven years of great plenty throughout the land of Egypt. This is a, guys, this is a big deal. Joseph, at this point, by God's power, is casting like a 14-year prediction. Um, and really even longer than that. But 14 years, seven years of plenty, and then seven years of famine will follow. Um, we are tempted... As, as people who are selfish and as people who try to provide for ourselves and people who like to, like when we get a paycheck, we like to go spend it, right? And then we get to the end of that period where that money is supposed to last us and we've run out of money because we, we ran out and like just, just threw it at stuff. Like you bought a car you can't afford or you bought so many clothes and you can't really eat anything but peanut, peanut butter and jelly at the end of the month. Like you will get to those days um, like in college and you'll have ramen noodles and you'll say, that looks so good right now because I have no money left, right? Because I went to a concert or because I took that girl out on an expensive date and all this kind of stuff. So what, what he's tempted to, to do or what we're tempted to do is to, to get these years of plenty around us and we're like, all right, we can spend and spend and spend. Sounding familiar, right, by the way, our economy, right, America? We, can, like, we are the power of the world. Like people bow down to us. 
seven years of plenty, and then, uh uh-oh, we owe some money, right? We can't pay it. We look like a bunch of idiots, and um, and that's kind of where we are, where we are right now, because we didn't save. We didn't save, right? So he's saying there's going to be seven years of plenty. There's going to be seven years of famine. If you will just save some of that back, don't be gluttons, right? You will be full on way less than is actually provided for you. Like in that seven years of plenty, there will be plenty. There will be more than you need. Don't eat it all, right? Don't consume it all. Don't, um, you know, overeat. Don't overspend. Save some of it back, and those seven years of plenty, you'll be fine. Now, he is talking about a whole nation, right? Geographically, the nation of Egypt is about the same, like, size as, as like, if you were to combine... Texas and New Mexico together. It's, it's a very, very large span. And one guy is, a, is about to suggest that this one guy heads up the task force that fixes this problem. This is a big deal, okay? So this is God's deal, and Joseph is about to be used in a big way. And what's interesting about it is that there, is, there, there are two stories happening here. There's the story about Joseph's family, right? And then there's a story about the rest of the world, right? Like, there's this story about Egypt and all this kind of stuff. But then there's a story about Joseph and his brothers. And it's about to get so, so interesting. Um, It goes on to say that the doubling of Pharaoh's dreams means that the thing is fixed by God, and God will shortly bring it about. Now, therefore, let Pharaoh... Okay, so this is where he, he goes from interpreting to suggesting. This is dangerous, This is where you say, all right, now, king, I'm going to tell you what you should do. Like, he's the king. And it's not just, like, democracy, right? This is, like, he sits on a throne, and he's the only one. He he may have some advisors, but he picks them. This guy's fresh out of prison. He's like, all right, I got some ideas, right? Here's my suggestion. Let Pharaoh proceed to appoint overseers over the land and take one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt during the seven plentiful years. Let them gather all the food of these good years that are coming and store them up um, under the authority of Pharaoh for food in the cities and let them keep it. That food shall be a reserve for the land against the seven years of famine that are to occur in the land of Egypt. So the land may not perish. Okay, so you guys will be fine. You have plenty as long as you just pay attention. Just, just save some. Don't eat it all. Just, just save some. The proposal, this is verse 37 in chapter 41. The proposal pleased Pharaoh and all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find a man like this? And whom is the spirit of God? (laughs) It's kind of funny. Verse 39, Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has shown you all this, there is none so discerning and wise as you are. You should be over my house and over my people. They shall order themselves as you command. Only as regards the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, and I'm sure at this point, Joseph's like, do you have a wife? Like, can we just keep her away from me at this point? Because I've been here, and I have done that. And, like, she ripped my robe off, and it got real ugly and, and weird and stuff like that. So he's like, I'm going to give you a gold chain, right? You're like, rapper status. He made him in a second, in a second chariot and called out before him, bow the knee. Thus he set him over all the land of Egypt. Um, Verse 44, moreover, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without, cons- without your consent, no one shall lift hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name, a name that I can't pronounce, and he gave him in marriage Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On. <laughs> it's an interesting name. So Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. And then verse 46, I'll just hit this real quick. He was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh the king. 30 years old. So a couple things are happening here. Maybe in Joseph's mind, he's starting to see where this whole greatness thing is coming about. And listen, it is 13 years later. You know, sometimes we, we feel like, you know, we get this clarification from God, like that he's with you and he's got a plan for you and, and, and you're going to make a difference in this world and, and you're expecting it to happen tomorrow at school, right? You're expecting this weekend there will be some, like, person who brings me up, um, like, like, I will be the pastor of Indian Springs Baptist Church as a sophomore in high school because I feel that God is with me, and it's just not that way. It's just not that way. In fact, 
whatever it is in your life, whether you want to be some business mogul or whether you want to be a pastor or a missionary, whether you want to be a doctor or a lawyer, it takes time. And in this case, Joseph's story illustrates to us that God was making him in this process. God was molding him and creating him. He became a different person. He became a person who at 17 years old, who, I'm so, you're teenagers, I'm going to offend you for just one second and then I'm going to be done, okay? No more, no more offenses, but I'm going to offend you. 17-year-olds um, are known for what? Awesomeness is not exactly what I was going for. Knowing everything. Right? Exactly. Like, oh, yeah, I totally know that. I, I was way past that. Okay. So as a 17-year-old, Joseph gets this nice robe, and he walks up to his brothers, and arrogantly, right, I, I just don't think this was God's plan. I don't know. I just, we'll get to heaven. We'll find out. But he walks up to his brothers, and he's like, hey, check it out. He likes me more than all of you. Oh, and if you were wondering, God actually wants to use me more than you guys too because you guys are going to bow down to me. Like he goes from it being all about him to this point where he's been in prison and in slavery and is called out and God gives him another opportunity, right, to be used by God. And you see the utmost humility. The first word out of his mouth is it's up to God just so you know it's up to God um, this is the pattern that you should follow okay offenses aside this is the pattern I should follow when I am given a task by God when God has called me up when God gives you an opportunity whatever it is and, and I'm saying these opportunities happen now. They will happen tomorrow. Opportunities to be used by God will happen this week, especially if you ask God for them. Have you ever prayed and asked God for an opportunity to be used by him? God, would you send me somebody who needs a little bit of love today? Send me someone who I can share my, my, my money or my resources or my time or maybe some kind words, some encouragement Send me somebody today who I can share your love with. You've given it to me. It's not all for me. It's for everybody. The gospel is for everybody. Like, allow me to be an agent of that, an avenue through which you can love people. It's not just for me. We tend to think it stops at us because we're selfish people. Listen, I'm a selfish person. When I am given something, I am thinking, wow, that's awesome. That's for me to spend on me. Like when I get like a gift, I'm like, that is for me. I'm so excited about that because I get to spend that on myself. And here's just what I want to say. When you are given a blessing, um, you are given that blessing so that you can be a blessing to other people all throughout life, all throughout life. The person that gets God is the person that knows that they don't own anything, Right? And that even when they're given something, that they don't own it, and they're to be a steward of that. To honor God and to love people. So you see the story of Joseph. You see him changing. He's a different person. Um, he's been made in the process. He's been molded, and he's been chiseled. And, and he comes out of prison, and he's like, it's up to God. I'd love to tell you that it's up to me. I'd love to tell you that you can trust me to get this done. I would love to make myself indispensable to you because I would love to not be in prison anymore. But it's up to God. If God wants to do it, he will. And if he won't, he won't. You can throw me back into prison if you want, but it's up to God. The person that lives that life, I think, is the person that is used by God the most. And God will do what he wants to do through whom he wants to do it through, right? So everyone wants to be Mother Teresa, but no one wants to do the work that she did, and no one wants to serve as hard as she served. No one wants to give up or sacrifice as much as she sacrificed, and that's why she has an impact. Or you think of maybe a spiritual leader, a pastor, a small group leader that you've had, and here's what you need to know. They've been on a process. And, and when they emerge and they're able to minister to you, 
is because they realize that it's not about them. Like, I've had that person in my life meeting me for coffee early in the morning to share the gospel with me and to, to share scripture with me, to call me after school and ask if I wanted to hang out because he, he wanted to share God's word with me. He re- it wasn't even about him. He was like, you know, my whole life, my whole life is just spent doing this with different people. And I was the recipient of that. And that's not on him. It's not because he's an awesome person. It's because God is awesome and chose to do a work in his life, and he got it. And he got it. And my guess is there's some of you that have experienced a person like that, whether it's someone in this church, another church, someone in your family, a friend. So we move on. He's 30 years old. This is uh, chapter 41, verse 46. He's 30 years old when he enters the, Pharaoh, um, the service of Pharaoh. I'm just kind of c- cover this quickly, um, but there's a couple things I want to hit. Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went through all the land of Egypt. That's an important verse because you need to know this. He was a hard worker, right? When he got out of prison, he worked hard, right? N- no joke, I'm sure he was weak, right? I- I'm not sure he got yard time to go lift weights, I'm not sure he was being fed really well. I don't know. We don't know. But this guy gets out of prison, and he is not entitled. He's not saying, I'm the king's servant. So what that means is I get to sit up in my tower and tell other people what to do. No, 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 no. He went out and did the work. That's the difference maker for some of you. You need to understand that when God calls you to something, it requires hard work, and it requires sacrifice. And Joseph got out of prison and was used by God, he went out through all the land. He, didn't, he, he wasn't entitled to like a, a position or a role or a title. Um, he, he didn't tell other people to do it. He went out himself and did the work. Um, so he gathered up the food that occurred um, or that, that of these seven years, which occurred in the land of Egypt, put the food in the cities. He put in every city the food from the fields around it, and Joseph stored up grain in great abundance. Okay, so he didn't do the minor bit of work that was required of him. He, he went over and above in great abundance like the sand of the sea until he ceased to measure it for it could not be measured. Before the year of the famine came, two sons were born to Joseph. Um, and so, so he is, is now a father of two boys, Manasseh and Ephraim. They would be greatly used later. Verse 53, the seven years of plenty that occurred in the land of Egypt came to an end and the seven years of famine began to come. Okay, so now he's 37 years old. Right? Okay, so he's, at this point, remember, he was 17 when he was thrown in a pit. Um, this, is, um, this is about to enter into the, the best part, at least my favorite, of this whole story. All the land was famished. The people ca- uh, cried to Pharaoh for bread. Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, go to Joseph. Okay, so this is the point where, like, what you said had better work. Right? Your plan, it's either about to work or not work. And, and, the, and the whole nation of Egypt is about to thrive or not thrive, and, and, and people from surrounding nations, because you, you'll find out in just a second, in the last verse of this chapter, um, all the earth came to Egypt, to Joseph, to buy grain, because the famine was severe over all the earth. This is not an Egypt problem. This is a surrounding areas, like regions of the earth, hemisphere problem. And Joseph who's had the crappiest life that you could imagine, who's being molded and shaped by God, is now in a position to love all those people. And he can do it. Why? Because he had mercy. Because mercy was not shown to him. And he had love. Because love was not shown to him. God was using those hurts and pains. And those are microcosmic words to describe what he went through. Like, they don't, we can't begin to explain what he went through because he sat there for years in prison unjustly and abandoned by his family. And he was in a position to love all these different people. You learn in verse 42 that his brothers, (laughs) they're still alive and they are part of the people that need food. So Jacob looks at them and I'm not, I'm kind of, just kind of paraphrasing, he's like, what are you looking at each other for? Go get food. And so they do not know at this point that Joseph is even alive, much less 
in Egypt, much less the guy that they're about to run into. Now, granted, think about it this way. Egypt is big, okay? So think, just think Texas. I mean, much less Texas and New Mexico, a big, a big area. If there was a, a, a United States-wide or North America-wide um, famine, like you wouldn't just go to one church in Dallas to go get food, right? That would be unwise. You would station them in San Antonio. You would station them in Houston. You would station them just all over the state. And so you're about to see Joseph's brothers run up on the one station that Joseph's at. Again, by God's providence, God's plan. So he says, go get some food. They, uh, they come and they bow themselves before him with their faces to the ground. This is uh, 42 verse 7. And, and I'm going to read 7 through 9 and then we're going we're gonna to blow through a couple chapters here. Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them. But he treated them like strangers and spoke roughly to them. Where do you come from? He said. They said from the land of Canaan to buy food. First of all, they're expecting to be spoken roughly to because they're Hebrews not welcome in a land like Egypt. Okay? Hebrews are, are slaves in Egypt. They knew that was a possibility, but they were going to die if they didn't get something. Verse 8, Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. Joseph remembered the dreams that he had dreamed of them. Um, it's been 20-something years since they've seen their brother. And he's one of the younger ones. And so he would have overgone the most change, just as you grow up and you change. And, and you'll experience this you know, later on in life where you see someone when you're in high school and then you'll, you'll just run into them like 20 years later and you're like, you're not, you're not quite sure. And like, you gained some weight and you've got a beard now and you're a female. That's kind of weird. Um, <laughs> but 20 years later, they don't recognize him. Now, one of the reasons they don't recognize him is because they're bowed down. But the other reason they don't recognize him is just clearly they, they, can't, they can't remember what he looks like. You'll see in a minute that they remember the story of Joseph. They've been talking about it. So you see several different times. Again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paraphrase because we only have a couple minutes left. But there's a couple moments where, where you see he's acting roughly with them. And, and this story is interesting because... Um, the quick telling of the story is his brothers came, he was merciful to them, and story over. Um, actually, what happens, let me kind of quickly recap. They come, they bow down, but Jacob does not send Benjamin. Benjamin is the tiny little baby of this family, and Jacob, when he's sending them to go get food, he's like, listen, y'all are shady people, and y'all could be up to something, and you killed one of my sons, and I'm not going to be left without a son. So Jacob, you're staying, I'm sorry, uh, Benjamin, you're staying here with me. So all the rest of the brothers go out, and they're humbled at this point. They're like, we have no choice but just to beg for food. And so they're begging for food. They don't know they're begging their brother for food. Um, so he recognizes them, and he recognizes that one's missing. And so basically he says, you've got a brother, don't you? You've got a father, don't you? And they're like, well, yeah. And he's kind of like, well, how's he doing? You know, how are they doing? Are they good? He's like, yeah, they're good. He's like, all right, you go get them and come back, which is a major request because from where they were at, like they left the promised land to come, to come here. They left Canaan to come to Egypt. This is what I read is, is like a six-week trip. Okay, now when we drive across the state of Texas, it's like all day, and that's in a car. Um, but when you're walking and pausing the camp out and walking and people get sick and walking and you have to stop and sleep for a while, it takes a long time. This is a six-week trip. So a 12-week trip, uh, maybe even round trip, cra crazy story here. And they're like, are you sure? Are you sure? I mean, we got to just for one dude, I mean, can we just get our food and go? He's like, all right, you can have your food. So they pay him and then he sends them back, but he has the guards put the money back in their bags and they get to keep the food and the money. So this is interesting because you're like, oh, how gracious, right? He, they get back, they realize the money is still in the bags, which is, is funny. You re, they, they realize after six weeks that the money's in the I was like, well, did you not open your suitcase? Are you that smelly? Like, this is like middle schoolers at camp, right? Did you not shower at all? Did you bring soap? You know? Tough crowd, got it. Okay. Um, so, like, we're in big trouble. We've still got the money. 
And so they're telling Jacob, and they're like, we, we don't know what's going on, but we need to take Benjamin. He's like, are you sure? We're sure. So they come back with Benjamin, um, and then, you know, there's, there's, there's this conversation about Jacob. Um, you know, how's your, how's your father? And, and, and there's a point where he brings him in to eat, right? But he sends people to say, you're going to eat with us, okay? So, so set up all these chairs, and we're going to eat together. And they think they're going to die, right? Because... You know, the king is requesting to eat with these Hebrews. Why would he do that? He's, he's from Egypt, we're Hebrews. And uh, it's a real interesting part of the story. Fast forward all the way to like chapter 45, and you see that Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. He cried. Okay, so he's, he's done hiding himself. This He's literally like not telling them. Like these are guys he hasn't seen in years and years and years. He's hiding the fact that he's Joseph. He can't handle it any longer. He's been, by the way, this whole, if you read the story, and I, I think you should, um, there's points where he can't bear to watch what they're going through. Now he's testing them to understand that they are um, sincere in their request. And they are. Right? They, they have nothing else to do. They're going to die if they don't get food. They're ultimately sincere. And as he's testing them, he runs out of the room several times to cry. Right? And he's, he's kind of hiding himself. And, and he can't bear it any longer. In chapter 45, Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. He cried, make everyone go out from me. He, this is like an ugly cry because everyone can hear it. He, no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. Two. He wept aloud so the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard it. This is a big house and everyone heard it. Um, Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? Interesting that that's the first question. You know, let your imagination go with why he asked that first. Is my father still alive? Because I'm sure he's concerned to, to, to see Jacob again. He hasn't seen Jacob yet. His brothers could not answer him for they were dismayed at his presence. And can you imagine how you would act if the kid that you sold into slavery um, only after you tried to kill him and you've forgotten about him and you thought he was dead. 19 years and you see him and they're dismayed. I, I think maybe if I were writing the Bible, I would say they were speechless. It just <laughs> ultimately humbled. What do you say? We threw you in a pit. Right? We made some money off you. And you're our brother. We betrayed you. His brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. Verse 4, so Joseph said to his brothers, come near to me, please. And he came near, and he said, I'm your brother, Joseph, whom you, <laughs> whom you sold in Egypt. Oof. Like, you, you don't know where to look. You're just you're staring at your feet because you don't want to make eye contact. Verse 5. Now, do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. That's ultimate humility. Because you have the power at this point to kill anyone you want. Right? They could be, they could be beheaded in, in, in second. And he not only doesn't kill them, but he says, oh, this, was, this was God's plan. This is kind of like Paul in Philippians where he's like, have great joy. Signed, Paul in prison. Like, I should be angry more than any of you guys. And he's like, ah, God sent me ahead to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years. Okay, so at this point, he's 39 years old-ish. And there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. Seven, God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and a keep alive for you, many survivors. Verse 8, so it was not you who sent me, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of his house all over Egypt. And then he basically says, go get your family. Come here. I've got a place for you to live. Right? I have millions of dollars. You don't have to work anymore. Like, come here. I've got a place for you to live. I've got houses ready for you to go. Pharaoh at this point hears that his family's there, and he's greatly pleased. And so they set up this area in Goshen, this little community for their whole family to live, which, by the way, is like striking the lottery. Like, if you could imagine, like at the end of your life, spending your, your greatest years, being able to spend them with your loved ones and, and work together and play together and just live together, it's like you're taken care of, right? Because I'm under Pharaoh's leadership and, and, and you're my family, so you're taken care of. 
So there's all of this where, where they go back and they get Jacob. They tell Jacob and he doesn't believe them, right? Because would you? Right? This was years ago. Uh, in fact, the, the phrase, um, where is it? I think they said um, his heart was, was cold and numb. They said it was numb. His heart was numb because he didn't believe them. Okay, so verse 47, I'm sorry, chapter 47, they come and they settle in Goshen. He has reconnected with Jacob. They have cried in the specific words, it says, for a good long while. Um, they, they exist through the famine, but the famine's not a big deal because not only is Joseph taking care of them, Joseph is taking care of the whole nation of Egypt. Um, and then what happens is everyone in Egypt, they can't pay their, they, they can't even pay for this, this wheat and this grain. And so they basically say, you need to buy us and you need to buy our land because we can't afford to even buy the leftover stuff. All our stuff is gone. All we have is our land. And so the Pharaoh like buys Egypt. It's a, it's a great acquisition. Like he buys the nation of Egypt. They all are taken care of. They're all under his um, reign at that point and really ownership. Um, they settled in the land of Egypt, in the land of Goshen. They gained possession of it. They were fruitful and multiplied greatly. Um, in verse, I'm sorry, ch chapter 48, chapter 49, there are blessings. There are blessings on Joseph's sons first, and then Jacob's own sons. Like Jacob is about to die, but he blesses Joseph's sons before he blesses his own. He blesses two grandkids of like the, the chosen one, I guess you, you, you would call him, the one he loved the most earlier, but... He blesses Joseph's sons, and then he blesses Jacob. By the way, read those blessings because they are not necessarily all positive. Like a blessing in this case, like he was saying, this is what your life's going to look like. And, and, and he's saying about some of his sons, you have no place in my household, right? Because you are an adulterer, right? You stole and you killed, and you knew it. You have no place in my inheritance, you know? Um, and so it gets kind of weird. Jacob dies, all the way to Genesis 50. Let me just hit this real quick. Genesis 50. Jacob dies. And the brothers at this point, 17 years after they have moved to Egypt. Okay, so they're, they're, they're just old. I think, it's, I think Joseph's like 57 at this point. And um, Jacob died. And at this point, they're like, the only reason that, that we're still alive is now dead. They think because Jacob died, now Joseph is going to kill all of them. And the only reason he didn't kill them in the first place it's because he wanted to honor his dad. So they're like, you're going to kill us, aren't you? He's like, mm -mm. no. 17 years. They lived for, in fear for 17 years. And here's, this is, this is the verse of this whole story. Genesis 37 to 50. This is the whole verse. Like, this is the, the big deal. Um, chapter, you all right over there? <laughs> Need a Band-Aid? His brothers also came and fell down before him. Interesting, right? That the dream that, that started it all is now coming true. I mean, it's already happened a couple times when they came and bowed for food. Joseph said to them, do not fear, for am I in the place of God? Verse 20. I want everyone listening to this. This is so important. And if you want to tune me out, you can. That's fine. Some of you didn't come to learn. That's okay. Verse 20. As for you, you meant it evil against me, but God meant it for good. To bring it about, right, this is the purpose statement, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear, I will provide for you and your little ones. And thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. You learn that Joseph would die at 110 years old. Um, and um, he had a chance to kill him. And he didn't. It wasn't even his mind. After all of that, Joseph rescues them, saves them. And it's not even that he, he like sees them and says, I hate you, get out of my sight. I'm not going to kill you, but get out of my sight. He provides for them on a daily basis. He takes what has been given him by God and does what? Spreads it and shares it. God blessed him so that he could be a blessing to others. So there's two people, there's two kinds of people in this room that are kind of echoing with this story. Maybe more than two, but here's what I see. Um, there's the people in here that are going to go through massive trials, and you're going to be made into something great. 
Not because you're great, but because God's great. Because he's got a plan and a purpose. But then the other person in this room, it's like you're one of the brothers, right? And the brothers did a crap thing to Joseph. They tried to kill him. They sold him into slavery. And then they apparently never even tried to go, like, help. Like, they just kind of lived the rest of their lives trying to forget it, right? trying to medicate themselves by just forgetting. And at the end of all this, they're rescued anyways. And that is the story of the Gospels. That you were an enemy of God, and you continually spit in his face with your life and your actions, and your heart and your attitude, he gave you all of this. Let's just, I'm not even talking about the fact that you live in America in, in, in prosperity. Um, I'm talking about the fact that you have eternal salvation, that you have a Holy Spirit that lives inside of you if you're a Christian. You have the inheritance of the kingdom. And we, we still act like Joseph's brothers. And so even in that, I want to reassure you that whatever you've done, God calls after you, he comes after you, and he wants to rescue you. He wants to be close to you. He wants to set up a land in Goshen and live with you, right? Like Joseph. He wants to provide for you. After you spit in his face, he wants you in your heart. I need you to know that. You can't run too far so that God can't catch you. You can't sin so much that God can't save you. That's the story of the gospel. And then he does save you. And that his grace and his mercy are everlasting. And they reach far, farther than you can comprehend. And so wherever you are in here, maybe, maybe this needs to be kind of a coming back to Jesus moment. Right? Where you have been running. You have been kind of trying to do life on your own. In your own strengths, your own rules, your own values. And you're like, the Bible's kind of weird. It's outdated. It's not popular in the, this culture. And you know what? God is king and he's Lord. And I... I'm calling you to give your life to him tonight. Or maybe return to him tonight. Don't let guilt make you hide from him any longer. It's not worth it. It's just not. I've lived that life where, where I feel like I've gone too far. I've done too much. I've, I've cursed God's name with my very lips that I praise him with in church services. And you know what? He still calls after you. He still loves you. He still sent his son. And you know what's crazy about it? It's not that you can do too much. He's already sent his son, right? It's happened. It is a truth. It is a reality. God not only is chasing after you, but he has already paid for it. And so for those of you in here that you're, you're thinking like, I've done too much, let me just throw it. He paid for it. It's paid for. And he wants your heart. He doesn't want you to do your checklist. He doesn't want you to go to church so you can make yourself feel better. He just wants your heart. So in just a couple of minutes, I just want you to bow your heads, and we're going we're gonna to go, and it's going to be a great rest of our night. Um, but you've got to spend some time thinking about that for just a second. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you just, not just for this story, but what it means to us, Lord, because this story is a story um, that, that is mirrored in the New Testament when Jesus comes after us, relentlessly pursuing us, coming after us with, with grace that we can't comprehend. Like Peter, we deny you. And you meet us on the beach and you say, do you love me? And we say, yes. Or may we, may we stop running. May we stop hiding from you. May we stop trying to hold on to our lives because we will lose it. Or may we find our lives because we lost it for your sake. Lord, it's in your name I pray.